Uh, last week, my wife and I had a couple friends visiting us from Naples, Italy. And we've known uh, these gentlemen for quite a long time because one of them is a, is a tour guide and he's been a, a tour guide for my wife's educational, high school educational trips that she's done for many years. And so we've gotten to be friends. He's been here before. And the other fellow that came along, he is struggling with English. He's taking English classes, but he's not... Um, he hasn't mastered the language yet. And so there were a f quite a few little humorous things where he would say something um, and it was wrong, but it was funny. For example, <clears throat> we took him to Shields. That's an American experience right there. They'd never seen so many guns in their lives. <laughs> and uh, we were at the checkout counter and uh, he was buying something and she was real friendly, the gal that was running the register there. She said, uh, she said, um, how are you? And he said, I'm fine. How are you? And she goes, I'm marvelous. And he goes, I'm Giovanni. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And then uh, they came to church and uh, afterwards, Giovanni was asking me <clears throat> about church and he was saying, this is so different than anything I've seen. I've only been in Catholic churches here and there and they're practically empty and it's all old people. He said, I, thought, I think what you're doing is wonderful. The music, the style, everything about it. He said, I'd go to a church like this. He said, and there's, there's all ages are there, but I see young people and I see enthusiasm. He said, I have one question for you. And I said, what's that? He said, how come there, there people are saying, hey man, hey man, like, you mean like when they see each other and they're, they're shaking hands, they say, hey, man? No, he said, no, while you were preaching, they were saying, hey, man. And I'm like, what? And finally, I realized it was amen. And the way they say it, the way they pronounce it, it's the same word in, in every language, in every culture. They all, they all have amen. They all have hallelujah. Uh, and, and yet, they pronounce it amen. And so, it sounded different to him. And he thought they were all saying, hey, man, hey, man. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. <laughs> It's okay to say amen in worship, okay? Or amen, or hey man. <laughs> it's a biblical expression of response. And we're in a series on worship where we've been filling in the blank every week. Worship is a verb, worship is a prayer, worship is costly, worship is a discipline, and today, worship is a celebration. We come to worship the Lord and we do so with joy because we have reason to celebrate. Amen? Amen. Good. You, you could say it either way you want. <clears throat> One of the most controversial sermons that I ever presented was on this subject. And, and this, this sermon got the church I was in so riled up, it wasn't this church, that they were ready to kick me out, some of them. I was in a fundamentalist, very traditional church, and I was trying to liven things up in that church. And so I preached a sermon entitled, Celebration or Hibernation? Question mark. Boy, did that message cause some sparks to fly. I didn't understand then, like I do now, why some people are opposed to thinking about worship as celebration. I was trying to remember what I said that was so controversial. And so, uh, young people, we used to have these things called files that we put paper in. And uh, I still have some of those from the past. And so I started digging through there, and I found my old notes from a message in August of 1990. And here's how I started off asking the congregation a series of questions. Here's my actual introduction. Would you rather spend an hour at a birthday celebration for someone you know and love or sitting still at a funeral for someone you don't even know. Unless you have some kind of morbid twist to your personality, that's an easy one, right? You'd pick the birthday party over the funeral. The one you'd look forward to with eager anticipation, probably arrive early for. The other you might dread. How do you think the average teenager looks forward to our typical church service? Ooh. Eager anticipation? Dread, or somewhere between those two extremes? <clears throat> I continued, should the atmosphere when we come together to worship be more like a festive, joyous birthday celebration or a long face, somber funeral parlor? Celebration or hibernation? The word hibernation calls to mind a sleeping animal hovering between consciousness and death. 
dormant, lethargic, apathetic, inactive. In contrast to the state of hibernation is that of celebration. To celebrate is to be festive, to rejoice, to party. Which of those two words more rightly represents what happens here every week? Which atmosphere do you want here? Which atmosphere does God want here? Which atmosphere is in heaven? Asking those questions and going on to say that I believe God wants us to celebrate in worship got me in a bunch of trouble in another place at another time. And I'm so glad to be delivered from those days. <laughs> and I'll never go back. And I'm so happy to be a part of a congregation where joy and celebration just happens naturally because people have been liberated from bondage or legalism and turned on by the gospel. Amen? I'm grateful to be a part of a worship community that understands and agrees with David when he said, Psalm 122, 9, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How, how, do you, how about you? Are you glad when you, th when you think about going into the house of the Lord? We are glad to go into the house of the Lord because we have reason to celebrate. Now, I want to take you back to... Uh, the first and one of the greatest celebrations in all of salvation history. Take you back to the story of the Israelites and, and the miraculous deliverance that happened when God brought them out of Egypt and they went through the Red Sea and then they had a celebration of God's goodness and God's uh, redemption. And I think we'll learn some more biblical principles as we're studying worship in this series. It's also a beautiful object lesson of God's style of redemption, his saving style, and what Christ accomplished for all humanity on the cross. Stories found in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Most of you have read the story. Even if you've never read the Bible, a lot of people started, and then the wheels came off in Leviticus. So you probably got this far, and if you didn't, you might have even seen Charlton Est Heston acting out this story, let my people go. The first 12 chapters of Exodus record the oppression of God's people as slaves in Egypt, the call of Moses to be a deliverer, and Pharaoh's unwillingness to let the people go over and over, hardening his heart, even as plague after plague was brought as a divine judgment upon Egypt. The bloody water didn't do it. The frogs didn't accomplish it. Lies, uh, flies and lice didn't bring it to pass. Neither did the death of livestock, painful boils, a severe hailstorm, clouds of locusts, or three days of darkness. But the tenth and final plague brought Egypt to its knees. The death of every firstborn in the land in homes where there was no blood on the doorposts. I think God in his mercy saved the most severe plague for last because I don't think that plague would have even happened if Pharaoh and the people had submitted to the God of heaven. But now they were humbled. And if you have a Bible or you like to read on a device, you might want to follow along some in this story. I'm going to read a few verses here and there beginning in um, Exodus 12, verse 31, it says, During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This is after the final plague. And he said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herd, and, as you said, and go, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. And then over in chapter 3, 13, verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. Now imagine what was happening back in the capital city of Egypt as the Israelites departed. There was mourning and wailing that could be heard all through the land. And, and there were funeral processions toward mass burial locations. But soon, grief turned to rage. Advisors come to Pharaoh. The people are speaking against you, O king. Some are complaining that you didn't 
let them go sooner. And others are enraged that you let them go unpunished because after all, they're the ones responsible for this curse of death. Other advisors arrive. Let us remind you, O Pharaoh, that your temples and other building projects will not be completed now. There'll be no monuments left to honor you. Instead, you'll be the laughingstock of future generations. You'll be known as the only Pharaoh ever conquered by his slaves. Pharaoh, who had hardened his heart after every plague, hardens his heart again. And it should not come as a surprise that he changes his mind. In, in chapter 14, verse 5, it says, When the king of Israel was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We've let the Israelites go and we've lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him, along with all the other chariots of Egypt and officers over all of them. And it says in, in verse uh, 10, Pharaoh approached the Israelites. As, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out in the desert to die? They started complaining. And then I love these words. Look at these words with me. Verse 13 and 14. But Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Wow, what a powerful exhortation. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. God's going to fight for you. Verse 19, then the angel of the Lord who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. And then we read verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Wow, spectacular to see something like that happen, to experience a miracle like that. Not long ago, some scientists made a model of the Red Sea and knowing how the Red Sea is, the, the, the basin, the floor is, they created this model and put a powerful fan on it. It says God sent an a, a east wind, a strong east wind. And, and in this model, I saw this video where there's a, there's a ridge that goes across a shelf that goes across certain parts of that. And a strong wind can blow the water off that ridge just for a little path right there. Who knows how God did it? It's a miracle. After the last service, somebody came and told me they were at the Lake of the Ozarks years ago, and there was a strong wind of 120 miles an hour that was between two tornadoes. It took down 1,200 trees on this little island, and it, he said, I wish I would have had a video to capture it because I saw the waters part when that 120 mile an hour straight wind, it's called a straight wind, um, as opposed to like a tornado, hit that water, it parted the water right where that wind hit it. It says there was a strong wind from the east. When I was a boy, I used to look at a picture of my mother's here and she used to read me when I was little these great storybooks on the Bible and some of them had full color pictures and I remember there was one that was like two pages and it was an artist concept of walking through the Red Sea and you could see the tall waters on both sides and, and, and parents and animals and children. There was one little boy that's looking in like he's looking for a fish. And I'm thinking, wouldn't that have been cool if there was fish and maybe you reach in and grab one as you're walking through? What a miracle! this was. It must have taken hours for several hundred thousand men, women, children, and li livestock to make their way across to the other side because it's in the wee hours of the morning when they're finally all across. Now, Pharaoh's army sees what's happening. God removed the, the cloud, and they see what's happening, and they attempt to follow right through the same path. You know, sometimes reason completely leaves a person who's totally sold out to evil. And that may be what we're seeing in, in Russia right now. But here, these Egyptians plunge into this path with water standing up. How foolish is that? After 10 plagues just hit them, they ought to know by now whose side this miracle working God is on. 
But it says there in verse 27 of chapter 14 that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. And then we read these powerful words in verse 30 and 31. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians... The people feared the Lord and put their trust in him. Wow, what a story. When the people saw the great salvation of the Lord, the miraculous deliverance, the text says, they feared. In other words, they they stood in awe and wonder and reverence and respect and honor. And it says they believed, they put their trust in the Lord. What was the very next thing they did? How did they respond to God's saving action? Well, they celebrated. They praised the Lord together in song. The very next verse, Exodus 15, 1 and 2, it says, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its riders he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I will praise him. I will exalt him. They celebrated. If you read on 18 verses of this song, it recounts the mighty saving actions of God and and, and it it, it declares a great message of assurance as it concludes in verse 18. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Amen? Amen? He is sovereign. He is worthy of praise and worship. Apparently, verse one was the chorus and the song was sung antiphonally or responsively. Um, You know, they didn't have projectors. And so I imagine Moses singing a phrase and the men repeat that phrase. And then the women respond with the chorus and they go back and forth. It says in verse 20, then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to the Lord, or sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has highly exalted the horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. I think that's the chorus there. That's how the song begins also back in verse 1. And so let's try this, okay? I'm going to see if you you can do as good as the other two services. So I'm going to say a phrase, and men, you say it out loud as one voice after me. You repeat it, okay? And then when I give you the cue, women, you look up here and read this all out loud together. Sing to the Lord, for he has highly exalted the horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. Let's try it. Let's we'll see, see how it goes. Okay. So men, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. And I will praise him. My father's God. And I will exalt him. Women, You did good. You did good. We could go through the whole song that way, and I believe that's how they did it. And it sounded like that, but there were hundreds of thousands of them filled with incredible joy, and they were praising God with all their might, singing and dancing and playing musical instruments, celebrating as a response to God's mighty saving actions on their behalf. Now, as you read through the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. This story is recounted over and over. Never forget what God did back then. Teach it to your kids. And when you get to the New Testament, the theological language of Paul and the other New Testament writers is heavily influenced by this Exodus event. I could show you examples of that. You see, the story of God's miraculous deliverance becomes a prototype of God's plan of salvation. Now, there's much that we could learn from this story, but I want you today to ponder three lessons from the Exodus story. Number one, only those who realize their impending doom can appreciate the gift of salvation. Think about how God accomplished this rescue plan. He could have done it different. He's, he's God. He could have done it a different way. Uh, he could have, as they walked up to the 
Red Sea, not even knowing the, the Egyptians were going to be coming after him. He could have just opened up the water and, oh, look at this. This is going to be a fun venture. And walked right through. Boy, I'm glad we didn't have to walk around this lake. And just went on. He could have done that. He didn't have to do it the way he did. But what he did intentionally is he allowed the people to get into a situation where they were doomed. And they were helpless without his salvation. Without his intervention, there was no hope, no way out. They were trapped and helpless. In fact, it says in Exodus 14, 10, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Friends, we too need to see what our true condition is apart from Jesus. We are condemned, lost sinners with no hope but death. And the average person who's not a follower of Jesus doesn't get this. They think they're not that bad. I've had these conversations many times. They're like, you know, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but I think I'm, I'm not bad. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty good compared to some people, especially. But that's not how God sees it. If you read the classic statement of the gospel that is the book of Romans that the apostle Paul was inspired to write, he spends the first three chapters nailing down the point that everyone is a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All people apart from Christ are doomed, damned, and deserving of death. That's, that's the reality. Anyone who's living outside of a relationship with Jesus is in worse shape than those Israelites confronted by armies on one side and water on the other. At least they could choose where they're going to die fighting or die swimming. But apart from Jesus, you have only one thing to look forward to, and that is eternal separation from God, for the wages of sin is death. <laughs> Praise the Lord for redemption. Jesus, by his substitutionary death on the cross, has parted the waters. And all you have to do is make that important, vital decision to walk through and to put your trust in him. Let's never forget what we've been rescued from. Bondage, slavery, certain death. Amen? Let us appreciate the gift of salvation. The second lesson to consider from this story is that salvation is all God's doing. Again, I'd have you look at these words in chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Mo Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You see, salvation is something God does for us. We must cooperate. They had to walk through the sea, but it was God that did the saving. God won't force anyone to be saved. He's not that kind of a God. He's not going to try to force you to love him or serve him, no. Someone could have stayed behind on the shore. They could have said, no, I don't trust that the water's going to stay up like that. I don't want to do it. You guys go. I'll stay here. They had to accept God's provision in order to be saved, but God did the saving, all the saving. And some people get confused, and they think salvation is partly God and partly me. And even people who believe in salvation by grace through faith, they'll say, well, God does his part, that's grace, and I do my part, that's faith, and together we, I, I, get, me, I get me saved. <laughs> that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches God saves first, and then we accept it or we reject it. That's our options. God didn't say, hey, I'll hold up one wall of water, you build a dike on the other side, and we'll do this together. None of us were there helping Jesus out at the cross. Salvation is all God's doing. And whatever we do is a response to what he has already done to save us. Look again at Exodus 14, 30. That day, the Lord saved Israel. The people feared the Lord and put their trust in him. You see, the Lord saved them first, and then they put their trust in him. Their belief or faith didn't save them. God saved them, and then they believed. And so, I mean, this is a technicality, but I, I, I like to get accurate. We aren't saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8. And we need to be clear on this important truth. Salvation is all God's doing. And these first two points set, set us up for this third point. Celebration is an appropriate and natural response to God's saving action. It says again in chapter 15, Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. I will praise him. Miraculous deliverance from bondage led naturally to joyous celebration. And 
It could have been easy for somebody to pipe up and start griping and say, hey, we can't celebrate anything until we get to the promised land. That's what God promised he was going to do for us. And we still have a desert to face. Hunger, thirst, wild animals, snakes, enemy armies, hardships, all of which they did face. And so we got all that ahead of us. This celebration thing is just not right. In the early 90s, I wrote an article on biblical praise and worship, which was published in a national magazine of the former denomination I was a part of. And I got a call in the middle of the night. And uh, young people, we used to have phones that had, that plugged in to the wall, you know, and it woke me up in the night at 1230 in the morning. And... uh, there was a 90-year-old woman on the other end of the line, I don't know how she got my number, from Tennessee, and she had just read my article, and she was disturbed by it. And uh, she was going to straighten me out. And basically, she was saying, you know, there's nothing to celebrate till we get to heaven. This earth, this earth is full of hardship and sorrow, and there's, we don't celebrate here, we celebrate there. In fact, I remember one line she said, she said, the church militant has nothing to celebrate, only the church triumphant. And so I talked to her a little about about this story. I said, you know what? The Israelites celebrated, not because all their trials and tribulations were over. There was a lot of that still ahead. But because God had set them free from bondage. He had answered prayer. He had done miracles for them. He had done for them what they could never do for themselves. He had saved them. And he is in control, so they celebrated. I don't know that I changed her mind, but I tried. (laughs) And I would ask you, has God done any of that for you? Do you have reason for joy and celebration? It all depends on your focus, really. Because when I focus on myself, I don't feel at all like celebrating. I I, I feel a little bit discouraged because I sometimes depressed because I see how sinful I am and how how many times I've fouled up and need to get back in alignment with God. But when I focus on God, and I see his holiness and his power and his perfect love and his certain victory, it makes me want to rejoice. Now, there are times we need to look at ourselves and investigate our lives, acknowledge our sin, and repent. That's important. 2 Corinthians 7.10 speaks positively about godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That's a good thing. Generally, though, those times of sorrowing over sin should be when we're alone before God and being honest for, before him, which we should do. But what should the general pattern of our lives be? Should we be focused on ourselves and going around all long-faced and gloomy? Or should we be focused on Christ and radiant with his joy? What do you think should be normal for followers of Jesus? Some religious people act like everything is gloom and doom from the womb to the tomb. Seriously. I think Christ followers should be the most joyous people of all people. What do you say? Amen? And when we come together like this for corporate worship, should our focus be on ourselves or on God? Read the Psalms. Biblical worship is always God-focused. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We're not just coming to try to get a blessing. We're coming to give a blessing. And in the process, we end up blessed, which is a beautiful thing. When our focus is on God and what he's done and what he is doing and what he will do, there is reason for celebration. There's two different views of salvation. One leads naturally to gloom and one leads naturally to joy. The first is that salvation is something we must accomplish. And that's a gloomy thought. If I thought I had to get myself perfect before I could be saved, I'd be depressed all the time. Because I I know better than anybody that I'm not perfect. And I'm never going to be. And I would want a church service that reflected the somber reality that I probably wouldn't make it. Just get together with a bunch of other people and be somber about the fact that I got to try harder this week, but I'll probably not make it. (laughs) There are are church services like that. No wonder people with this view feel like there's nothing to celebrate. The other view, of course, the correct view, is that salvation is something that God accomplishes and that my passport to heaven has nothing to do with my righteousness, but it's completely dependent on the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
And that's a liberating concept. That's something to rejoice about. It's a reason to celebrate. And that's why the Israelites celebrate here in Exodus 15, because God did something for them that they could never have done for themselves, period. Imagine with me that it didn't happen like this. Imagine that God didn't open the water. And so here comes these angry Egyptian army people, and the Israelites are faced with a showdown, and they have to make a decision. And some of them decide to go back to slavery, and they just surrender. And some of them try to fight, and they're killed. And some of them say, I'm going to swim. And they take off. They jump in the water and start swimming like they're swimming the English Channel. And most of them drown. But a few super athletes make it all the way across. And they pull themselves out of the water on the other side. (sighs) And they're gasping for air. And they made it. Do you think that standing there on the other side, they would have had the same kind of celebration we read about here in Exodus 15? No way. They probably would have mourned and whined and complained. Any celebration would have sounded hollow and contrived. Friends, we aren't saved because we're the strongest or the most perfect swimmers. We're saved because God has opened up the water and he's put a pillar of fire and a cloud between us and the enemy. Amen? And that is something to celebrate. And celebration is an appropriate and natural response to God's saving action. One of the ways we celebrate in worship is through the Lord's Supper, through communion. And today is a very appropriate time, given this message, for us to take communion together. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward, and if you did not receive one of these little packets, just catch their eye, and they'll give you one. It has two flaps on it, one for bread and one for the cup, and uh, we started using these about six and a half years ago. We moved in this building for convenience and for sanitation purposes, and when we first started, people hated it because they liked the, they said, this bread is not so tasty. Uh, But you know, then COVID hit and all churches went to this and we were just ahead of the times. It's about more than how how much you have or how it tastes. It's about what it represents. Now, what happened the night before our story of the Red Sea? Well, the night before the Exodus was the 10th plague the death of the firstborns in the land. But God in his mercy told the people, he said, hey, here's what I want you to do. Take an innocent little lamb, a perfect lamb, and sacrifice it. And take its blood, put a cloth in it, and wipe it on the outside of your doorposts, on the top, on the sides. Stain your doorposts with blood. And when the death angel passed, comes when he sees that blood he will pass over your children will be safe several thousand years later Jews still celebrate Passover that 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 night that event when God saved the people with blood on the doorposts but that event It's not only something to look back to, like the Jews do to this day, but something that was meant to look forward to the cross, to the ultimate lamb who was slain, to to the the need to, to put that blood on the doorposts of our heart and be protected by his perfect finished work on our behalf. And so the night before Jesus was crucified, He celebrated Passover with his disciples. But he knew that that was the last official Passover in terms of the need to celebrate Passover because he was instituting now as a part of the new covenant, a new supper, the Lord's Supper, communion. And so it came a a, a time during the supper where instead of taking a piece of lamb or any of the other ingredients of a traditional Passover supper, because he, the next day, was going to 
bring lamb sacrifices to an end by being slain himself as the ultimate lamb who takes away the sin of the world who died once for all. Instead, he picked up some bread and a cup of wine. And he said, this represents my body, which is given for you. Take and eat of it and do this in remembrance of me. And he said, this represents my blood, which is shed for you as the new covenant. He said, all of you drink from it and do this in remembrance of me. So every time we take communion, we remember the cross. We look backwards. But we also look forward because he said, do this until I come. And in fact, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. Wow. Jesus is still waiting, still waiting. That glass of wine he's going to toast you with someday. It's a beautiful thought. Father, thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. As we take communion, we remember what you have done for us, and we appreciate it, and we respond with celebration. And if there's someone here who's not yet said yes to you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would have the courage right now, maybe even in the act of communion, for the first time to say, hey, I'm going to mark the day, April 3, 2022. That's when I crossed the line and said yes to Jesus. For the rest of us, may this be a time of rededication recommitment as we realize that our salvation is completely from outside. It's not something that we work up, just like these elements that we take now and we eat and drink. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's stand together and let's do it. Let's celebrate.